Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I am here today to talk about some of my most anticipated books of 2023. This video is a little late this year, but I've done this the last couple of years and talked about books that I'm really excited for coming up in the current year. I usually do it in January for various purposes, reasons and purposes. It's been delayed until almost the end of February. Part of that is that I have not quite liked... Um, the way I've thought about my most anticipated books in previous years. And what uh, briefly, all I mean by that is that in the past, I have used this as a list of books that I hold myself accountable for reading throughout the year. Last year, I had a check-in at the midway point about how many of them I had read, and then I had another check-in toward the end of the year. And I did the same thing, but only at the end of the year, uh, the year before that. And I've tracked how many of the books I have read this year, I want to do away with the accountability portion of that. I am going to give myself a little bit of leeway in case I decide I don't want to read these books. Or, like, you know, things change over time, especially since I'm going to go through these books in order, starting with ones that have already been released and uh, ones that are releasing now and uh, go down to, like, September and October. So, obviously, circumstances change. New information comes in about other books. You start seeing reviews and things like that. And that can change your opinion about whether or not you want to read a book. So I want to give myself a little bit of leeway for that to happen organically and for books to be available or not, because then if I'm holding myself accountable to reading these, my library doesn't get all of them. My subscription apps like Scribd and uh, don't get them either. So then I feel like I'm accountable to purchase a copy of the book and it just becomes a whole thing. So I'm going to give myself a little, little bit of leeway to say that these are sort of suggestions. It's a pile of possibilities, if you will, because I like that term so much more than a TBR, for books that are coming this year that have caught my interest. And I might read them, I might not. And we'll see how that goes. So let's get into the actual list, because I have a, a bunch of things. The, the, removing the accountability for this really opened up the list. Uh, I, I tried to keep it small when I was trying to think about books that, that I would hold myself accountable for reading throughout the year. I've let it get a little bit bigger. Now, as I said, I've been building this list since December and plugging away at it, and I just really haven't had the time to sit down and do this video and uh, finish the list and all of that stuff. So some of these books are already released. And so I'm going to start with ones that we're, we're going to go by release date. So we're going to start with ones that have been released earliest, and then we're going to go to ones that have actually come out. So the first one is called Red Clay Susie by Jeffrey Dale Lofton. And forgive me, I'm going to rely a little bit on blurbs that are online. All of these books will be listed in the description box down below, and all of them will have a link either to bookshop.org, which is a website that I really like because it's an alternative to Amazon and because it will help support independent bookstores. I encourage you, as always, to please use bookshop.org if at all possible, or obviously use your independent bookstore and pre-order, 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 because it's a really important thing, especially with the supply chain still being a mess. But anyway, you can also seek out more information at those links. There are a couple of books that are not released in the United States yet, or which are not on, they're so far in the future that they're not on Bookshop yet, so there will be links to either a publisher website or an independent bookstore in the UK that can also sell the book. So that will all be in the description box down below. Back to Red Clay Susie. What they say is, the coming-of-age story of Philbit, a gay, physically misshapen boy in rural Georgia who battles bullying, ignorance, and disdain as he makes his way in life as an outsider, before finding acceptance in unlikely places. Fueled by tomato sandwiches and green milkshakes and obsessed with cars, Philbit struggles with life and love as a gay boy in rural Georgia. He's happiest when helping Granddaddy dig potatoes from the vegetable garden that connects their houses. But Philbit's world is shattered and his resilience shaken by events that crush his innocence and sense of security, expose his misshapen chest skillfully hidden behind shirts Mama makes at home, and convince him that he's not fit to be loved by Knox, the older boy he idolizes to distraction. Over time, Philbit finds refuge in unexpected places and inner strength in unexpected ways, leading to a resolution in the form of a letter from beyond the grave. Elements of the plot do sound very familiar and sort of tried and true. I think the sort of twist on this is that it involves a coming of age for a queer person in a rural and very conservative 
part of the country, which sounds very interesting to me. This is published by Post Hill Press. It was released on January 10th, so it's already out there. My library does not have a copy. I did recommend that they purchase a copy, which is another thing that you can do for any of these books that you are interested in. Obviously, I know budgets for new books can be limited, so you can utilize your library if an independent bookstore or bookshop is not uh, an option for you. So uh, I recommended my library purchase a copy. You can feel free to do the same in your local area. This is something that I am not running out to read, but which really did catch my interest. And I've been kind of hoping for feedback. So if you've already read it since it's out, let me know what you thought of it in the comment section down below. Then we get to The Far Away World, which are stories by Patricia Engel. I read Infinite Country, which is a novella, a very slim little book by Patricia Engel, and I loved it. I think it's everything that American Dirt was supposed to be, like everything people wanted out of American Dirt, Infinite Country did way better. American Dirt is a mess, a terrible book. So I always point people to Infinite Country instead of that mess. The Far Away World is a story collection. I know stories are not everybody's cup of tea. I happen to like them, but Patricia Engel did an interview. I, I can't remember if it was on NPR's Book of the Day or on the newly revamped New York Times Book Review podcast, but it really made me even more interested to read this book. I actually do have access to a copy of the audiobook, and I'm really hoping to get to it soon. I've just had other things on my plate right now. Here's the description. From Patricia Engel, whose novel Infinite Country was a New York Times bestseller and a Reese's Book Club pick, comes an exquisite collection of 10 haunting, award-winning short stories set across the Americas and linked by themes of migration, sacrifice, and moral compromise. Two Colombian expats meet as strangers on the rainy streets of New York City, both burdened with traumatic pasts. In Cuba, a woman discovers her deceased brother's bones have been stolen, and the love of her life returns from Ecuador for a one-night visit. A cash-strapped couple hustles in Miami to life-altering ends. The Far Away World is a collection of arresting stories from New York Times bestselling author of Infinite Country, Patricia Engel, a gifted storyteller whose writing shines even in the darkest corners. According to the Washington Post, intimate and panoramic, these stories bring to life the liminality of regret, the vibrancy of community, and the epic deeds and quiet moments of love. That description enough would have been enough to get my attention. The fact that it's from an author that I've liked before with The, the Infinite Country, uh, it also would have been enough. But hearing her talk about the intentions of the stories and the thought that went into them really caught my interest. So I am very much looking forward to that. It is published by Avid Reader Press, which is part of Simon & Schuster. It was published on January 24th. Like I said, I have access to an audio copy. I just need the time to get to it, which is kind of the problem. Here's a book that is already released in the UK. I'm going to have a link to the store Gaze the Word in the description box down below. It's Becoming Ted by Matt Cain. So if you follow along, you know one of my favorite books from last year was The Secret Life of Albert and Whistle. I'll have a link to the video where Joel and I talk about our favorite books of 2022 down below as well, because he loved that Joel uh, as well. And this is a new book by Matt Cain. I really want to read it. Unfortunately, unlike Secret Life of Albert and Whistle, it does not appear to have been released in the United States, at least not yet. I'm hoping it will follow. We actually did order a copy. I think we we did not order from Gaze the Word. I think we ordered from Queer Lit, which is another uh, independent book, bookstore that uh, obviously focuses on queer books in the UK. So hopefully our copy is on its way because this was released on... January 23rd. So here's what it's about. Ted Ainsworth has always worked at his family's ice cream business in the quiet Lancashire town of St. Luke's on Sea, but the truth is he's never wanted to work for the family firm. He doesn't even like ice cream, though he's never told his parents that. When Ted's husband suddenly leaves him, the bottom falls out of his world, but what if this could be an opportunity to put what he wants first? This could be the chance to finally follow his secret dream, something Ted has never told anyone. It sounds very much in the vibe of The Secret Life of Albert Entwistle, which again, I loved, and it sounds like it will be wholesome, but not sort of empty calories, pun I guess intended, on the whole ice cream thing. I, I am really intrigued by this, and I am hoping that we get our copy soon, because I would love to read Becoming Ted. Then we get to a recent edition. In fact, this, I, I think I had seen that it was coming out. It's this other Eden by Paul Harding, and 
I didn't really pay attention to it. The thing that finally got it on my radar is that they talked about Paul Harding because of a profile they did in the New York Times Book Review podcast. And that really got me interested in this book. I had kind of, I think part of why I had not really focused on this book is that for Paul Harding, I feel like I need to read Tinker's first because that is his book, which won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. It was a huge surprise. Nobody saw it coming. No, not many people even knew about Tinker's at all. So it just was a huge surprise. And then his only other novel was a follow-up to Tinker's. I, I don't, it's, I don't know if it's a strict sequel. It's called Enon. I have a copy over here. And then Tinker's is obviously on my Pulitzer shelf, which is over there. But I uh, am waiting on that one until I read Tinker's. And I think I had just put this one off in my mind until um, I read Tinker's. But it sounds fascinating. Here is what they say on in the blurb on Bookshop. In 19, I'm sorry, in 1792, formerly enslaved Benjamin Honey and his Irish wife Patience discover an island where they can make a life together. Over a century later, the Honey's descendants and a diverse group of neighbors are desperately poor, isolated, and often hungry, but nevertheless protected from the hostility awaiting them on the mainland. During the tumultuous summer of 1912, Matthew Diamond, a retired, idealistic, but prejudiced schoolteacher turned missionary, disrupts the community's fragile balance through his efforts to educate its children. His presence attracts the attention of authorities on the mainland who, under the influence of the eugenics thinking popular among progressives of the day, decide to forcibly evacuate the island, institutionalize its residents, and develop the island as a vacation destination. Beginning with a hurricane flood reminiscent of the story of Noah's Ark, the novel ends with yet another ark. In prose of breathtaking beauty and power, Paul Harding brings to life an unforgettable cast of characters, Iris and Violet McDermott, sisters raising three orphaned Penobscot children, Theophilus and Candace Larks and their brood of vagabond children, the prophetic Zachary, Hand to God Proverbs, a Civil War veteran who lives in a hollow tree, and more. The spellbinding story of resilience and survival, the other, this other Eden is an enduring testament to the struggle to preserve human dignity in the face of intolerance and injustice. I mean, the story sounds interesting as well, but the review of it that they gave really caught my attention. And this is based on a true story, which makes it a little difficult. I wonder if Heidi knows about this because of the main setting. Uh, it is published by W.W. Norton and Company. It was published on January 24th. I looked it up and it is on Scribd for me as an audio. So I'm hoping I will be able to get to this book soon. And I'm really looking forward to it. I might even do this one before I read Tinker's. And I, I now as I'm thinking about that, I had been thinking I had to do Tinker's first. But now I'm thinking if I do read this one first, it could enrich my experience of Tinker's when I go back. That's what I'm telling myself, at least. But it's me justifying my interest in a different book by Paul Harding right now. It also got a starred review in Kirkus, which, yeah, really got my attention. Next is another book that has been released. It's Hijab Butch Blues, a memoir by Lamia H. Here's what they say. When 14-year-old Lamia H. realizes she has a crush on her teacher, her female teacher, she covers up her attraction, an attraction she can't yet name by playing up her role as overachiever and class clown. Born in South Asia, she moved to the Middle East at a young age and has spent years feeling out of place, like her own desires and dreams don't matter, and it's easier to hide in plain sight, to disappear. But one day in Quran class, she reads a passage about Miriam that changes everything. When Miriam learned that she was pregnant, she insisted no man had touched her. Could Miriam, uninterested in men, be like Lamia? From that moment on, Lamia makes sense of her struggles and triumphs by comparing her experiences with some of the most famous stories in the Quran. She juxtaposes her coming out with Musa liberating his people from the Pharaoh, asks if Allah, who is neither male nor female, might instead be non-binary, and drawing on the faith and hope none needed to construct his ark, begins to build a life of her own, ultimately finding that the answer to her lifelong quest for community and belonging lies in her own identity as a queer, devout Muslim immigrant. Obviously, this is nonfiction since it's a memoir. And it sounds fascinating. And from the title, I, I don't know to what extent, but it seems like it plays with Stone Butch Blues by Leslie Feinberg, which is one of the books we are going to be reading for the Queer TBR Tackle in June. And I, I don't know how much this sort of parallels that, if at all. But since it seems to at least nod in that direction, I'm thinking I might want to read Stone Butch Blues first and then seek this one out. But it does sound 
absolutely fascinating. Can't wait to read it. It is published by Dial Press, and it was published on February 7th, so it's already out there. My library does not have a copy. I did already check, but I did recommend that they purchase a copy of it, which, again, is a nice alternative to purchasing a copy, depending on where you are, because my library tends to ignore the suggestions that are LGBTQ plus in nature. It is what it is. You know, all I can do is keep recommending them, and try not to create a tangle with my headphones. <laughs> the next one is something I actually already have a copy of. It's an ARC of. It's called On the Savage Side by Tiffany McDaniel. This was published on February 14th, so recently. This is published by Knopf. So I have a copy of Betty, which is this book right here. That was um, Tiffany McDaniel's previous novel, and um, I really want to read it. The spine jumps out to me all the time when I'm looking at my shelves. I really need to get to it. But I'm sort of excited for this one as well. Here's what they say. Six women, mothers, daughters, sisters, gone missing. Inspired by the unsolved murders of the Chillicothe Six, this harrowing novel tells the story of two sisters, both of whom could be the next victims. Arcade and Daffodil are twins born one minute apart. With their fiery red hair and thirst for escape, they form an unbreakable bond nurtured by their grandmother's stories. Together, they disappear into their imaginations and forge a world all their own. But what the sisters can't escape are the generational ghosts that haunt their family. If you know me, you know I love generational family things. Growing up in the shadow of their rural Ohio town, the sisters cling tightly to one another. Years later, Arcade wrestles with the memories of her early life just as a local woman is discovered drowned in the river. Soon, more bodies are found. As her friends disappear around her, Arcade is forced to reckon with the past while the killer circles closer. Arcade's promise to keep herself and her sisters safe becomes increasingly desperate, and the powerful riptide of the savage side becomes more difficult to survive. Drawing from the true story of women killed in Chillicothe, Ohio, acclaimed novelist and poet Tiffany McDaniel has written a moving literary testament and fearless elegy for missing women everywhere, which of course sounds fascinating. And obviously this is also a novel that, that is dramatic in nature, but plays with sort of thriller elements, which makes it really interesting. And especially because Betty also used true elements sort of inspired by and then spun them into a fictional story. And this seems to be in the same wheelhouse as that. So I am looking forward to it whenever I have time. Time is the problem. You know, I have a full-time job and, I'll, you know, you know, you know how the world works. Just got to keep trying to find the time. The next one is actually something I just started on audio. I had pre-ordered a copy of the audio on Libby. It's Oscar Wars, A History of Hollywood in Gold, Sweat, and Tears by Michael Shulman. If you know me, you know I'm sort of obsessed on the side with the Academy Awards. It's an ongoing thing. So perhaps it's not so surprising that this caught my attention. Here's what they say. America does not have royalty. It has the Academy Awards. For nine decades, perfectly coiffed starlets, debonair leading men, and producers with gold in their eyes have chased the elusive Oscar. What began as an industry banquet in 1929 has now exploded into a hallowed ceremony, complete with red carpets, envelopes, and little gold men. But don't be fooled by the pomp. The Oscars, more than anything, are a battlefield where the history of Hollywood and of America itself unfolds in dramas large and small. The road to the, the, road to the Oscars may be golden, but it's paved in blood, sweat, and broken hearts. And I'm going to stop there. It goes on. So it uses some of the controversies of the Academy Awards and of campaigns to talk about the history of the Academy Awards. And in that, the history of cinema in general and some of the seismic shifts that it has undergone over this last century. Like I said, I just started it this morning and the opening is really talking about the in invention of the Academy Awards um, and framing this as a way of using the Academy Awards to look at cinema and movie going and popular culture in general. So, so far, so good. I'm really enjoying it. This was published on February 21st, so just this week as I'm filming this, and it was released by Harper. It's very much a me book. Maybe it's not a you book, but hopefully you can understand why it really caught my attention. Another book that was released this week is I Have Some Questions for You by Rebecca Mackay. Before I put the picture up, I'm going to mention The Great Believers, which is this book right here. That was Rebecca Mackay's previous book, which was a Pulitzer Prize finalist and one of my favorite reads. I think it was my favorite read of the year in which it was published. And now let's talk about I Have Some Questions for You. I wanted to give that framework because 
The Great Believers is really why I am so interested in this book. To be honest with you, the description of the book itself probably would not have landed it on this list. It's really the association with a book that I loved in the past. Um, and being honest, that is where uh, the expanding of this list, because I'm not holding myself accountable to read this book, uh, these books on this list came in, because if I was holding myself accountable, I might have left this one off. It seems like it involves sort of dark, dark academia and a little bit of thriller, but not in the same way as on the Savage side. Here's what they say. A successful film professor and podcaster, Bodie Kane is content to forget her past. The family tragedy that marred her adolescence, her four largely miserable years at a New Hampshire boarding school, and the murder of her former roommate, Thalia Keith, in the spring of their senior year. Though the circumstances surrounding Thalia's death and the conviction of the school's athletic trainer, Omar Evans, are hotly debated online, Bodie prefers, needs, to let sleeping dogs lie. But when the Granby School invites her back to teach a course, Bodie is inexorably drawn to the case and its increasingly apparent flaws. In their rush to con convict Omar, did the school and the police overlook other suspects? Is the real killer still out there? As she falls down in the very rabbit hole she was determined to avoid, Bodie begins to wonder if she wasn't as much of an outsider at Ganby as she had thought. If perhaps back in 1995, she knew something that might have held the key to solving the case. So obviously there are a lot of thriller elements in this book. I do have access to an audio copy of it. I'm going to be prioritizing a lot of other things before I get around to it. Part of me is waiting for feedback from other people who read this, to be honest. But it sounds interesting. It sounds like it relies on existing formulas. It definitely sounds familiar, mostly in the thriller realm. So I think the sort of twist that makes this one a little bit different is that it is from a tra traditionally dramatic author. And um, we'll see. I'm interested, but again, mostly because I really liked The Great Believers, not necessarily because of the description of the book itself, being honest. And again, since it came out this week, if you have read it or have started it, I would love to hear what you have been thinking of it in the description box down below. Let's go on to the next one, which is another one that I probably would have left off if I was holding myself accountable to reading these books. It's Old Babes in the Wood, Stories by Margaret Atwood. It is published by Doubleday Books and will be releasing on March 8th. We are now at the point where we're talking about books that are coming in the future. So it's short stories by Margaret Atwood. I don't know if you need much more than that, to be honest. It's stories by Margaret Atwood, and um, I believe it says that it's her first short fiction book since 2014's Stone Mattress. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this. I'm just going to throw it out there and say that it is a book that will be released on March 7th. You probably already know about it, and you probably already know if you are interested in it or not, just because it is Margaret Atwood. That takes us to another book that I already have an ARC of. It is In Memoriam by Alice Wynn. I actually first heard about this book because of the people in the E.M. Forster uh, and LGBTQ read-along. Uh, I'll have information about both of those down below. So this is published by Knopf and again will be released on March 7th. Here is what it says online. A haunting and virtuosic debut novel about two young men who fall in love during a time of war. It's 1914 and World War I is ceaselessly churning through thousands of young men on both sides of the fight. The violence of the front feels far away to Henry Gaunt, Sidney Elwood, and the rest of their classmates, safely ensconced in their idyllic boarding school in the English countryside. News of the heroic deaths of their friends only makes the war more exciting. Gaunt, half-German, is busy fighting his own private battle, an all-consuming infatuation with his best friend, the glamorous, charming Elwood, without a clue that Elwood is pining for him in return. When Gaunt's family asks him to enlist to forestall the anti-German sentiment they face, Gaunt does so immediately relieved to escape his overwhelming feelings for Elwood. To Gaunt's horror, Elwood rushes to join him at the front, and the rest of their classmates soon follow. Now death surrounds them all in all its grim reality, often inches away, and no one knows who will be next. That is In Memoriam by Alice Wynn. Really hoping to have the time to read that book soon, because it sounds fascinating. I, Jen the Librarian did read it and was not too enthusiastic about it, but she is also much more knowledgeable about World War I than I am. So I'm hoping that that lack of knowledge on my part will um, help me <laughs> in that regard. Now let's talk about Ander and Santi Were Here 
by Johnny Garza Villa. This is going to be published by Wednesday Books on May 2nd. They say, and, and right away you know how this caught my attention, Aristotle and Dante discover the secrets of the universe meets the sun is also a star in this YA contemporary love story. I love Aristotle and Dante. I have not read The Sun is Also a Star, but I love Aristotle and Dante. Here we go. The Santos Vista neighborhood of San Antonio, Texas is all Ander Lopez has ever known. The smell of pan dulce, the mixture of Spanish and English filling the streets, and especially their job at their family's taqueria. It's the place that has inspired Ander as a muralist, and as they get ready to leave for art school, it's all of these things that give them hesitancy, that give them the thought, are they ready to leave it all behind? To keep Ander from becoming complacent during their gap year, their family fires them so they can transition from restaurant life to focusing on their murals and prepare for college. That is, until they meet Santiago Garcia, the hot new waiter. Falling for each other becomes as natural as breathing. Through Santi's eyes, Ander starts to understand who they are and want to be as an artist, and Ander becomes Santi's first steps toward making Santos Vista and the United States feel like home. Part of what sounds interesting about this is obviously the Aristotle and Dante, but also the um, centering of a non-binary character, and obviously there is something of a queer romance in there, which is another thing that really just speaks to me, and uh, which I instantly enjoy. So I'm looking forward to that book. Now we have The Skin and Its Girl by Sarah Cipher. This will be published on April 25th. I think I got a little out of order here. By the way, this is where I should mention that uh, release dates can change. So please, I'm going to mention them, but don't hold me to them because they can move around. And uh, this book will be published by Ballantyne. A young, queer, Palestinian-American woman pieces together her great aunt's secrets in this sweeping debut confronting questions of sexual identity, exile, and lineage. I could stop right there. And you would understand why this caught my attention. I actually do have access to this on NetGalley. I'm hoping to read it before it will be released. But, you know, time, again, is sort of the problem here. In a Pacific Northwest hospital far from the Romani family's ancestral home in Palestine, the heart of a stillborn baby begins to beat and her skin turns vibrantly, permanently cobalt blue. On the same day, the Romani's centuries-old soap factory in Nabias is destroyed in an airstrike. The family matriarch and keeper of their lore, Aunt Nuha, believes that the blue girl embodies their sacred history, hearkening back to a time when the Romanis were among the wealthiest soap makers and their blue soap was a symbol of a legendary love. Decades later, Betty returns to Aunt Nuhu's gravestone faced with a difficult decision. Should she stay in the only country she's ever known or should she follow her heart and the woman she loves, perpetuating her family's cycle of exile? Betty finds her answer in partially translated notebooks that reveal her aunt's complex life and struggle with her own sexuality, which Nuha hid to help the family immigrate to the United States. But as Betty soon discovers, her aunt hid much more than that. So there's obviously an element of sort of magical realism in here, which I know turns a lot of people off. It can be frustrating done badly. I'm hopeful that this will be an example of it done well. And we'll see. Again, I have access to it on NetGalley. The problem is just finding the time to get to all of these books. Then we get to another one of the British books. And this one I do not believe has any plans to be released in the U.S. right now. So I have a copy pre-ordered from the U.K. I, down below I have a link to Queer Lit, which is a, a queer bookstore in Manchester. And this was recommended to me by someone on the channel. I apologize, I don't remember who. Uh, but it was based on my appreciation of The Secret Life of Albert and Whistle. So here is what they say. The, uh, by the way, this will be released on April 13th. So again, I feel like I'm out of order because the last one was later in April. But it's fine. It's fine. The feel-good read of 2023. Perfect for fans of Mike Gale, Beth O'Leary, and Alice Oseman's Heartstopper. When 79-year-old Arthur Edwards gathers his family together to share some important news, no one is prepared for the bombshell he drops. He's gay, and after a lifetime in the closet, he's finally ready to come out. Arthur's 21-year-old grandson, Teddy, has a secret of his own. He's also gay and developing serious feelings for his colleague, Ben. But Teddy doesn't feel ready to come out yet, especially when Arthur's announcement causes shockwaves in the family. Arthur and Teddy have always been close, and now they must navigate first love's heartbreak and finding their place in their community. But can they and their family learn to accept who they truly are? I want this book now. <laughs> like, right now. I'm so looking forward to it. It sounds like everything that I love and appreciate and just, I, I want it now. Um, but I'm going to have to wait. 
Next is The Late Americans by Brandon Taylor. Brandon Taylor was uh, shortlisted for the Booker Prize for the book Real Life, which I really enjoyed. I have not read his story collection that was published. I don't remember if it was last year or the year before. What is time? But I have wanted to read more of his books, and I'm looking forward to this one. This will be published by Riverhead on May 23rd. In the shared and private spaces of Iowa City, a loose circle of lovers and friends encounter, confront, and provoke one another in a volatile year of self-discovery. At the group's center are Ivan, a dancer-turned-aspiring banker who dabbles in amateur pornography, Fatima, whose independence and work ethic complicates her relationships with friends and a trusted mentor, and Noah, who didn't seek out sex so much as it came up to him like an anxious dog in need of affection. These three are buffeted by a cast of poets, artists, landlords, meatpacking workers, and mathematicians who populate the cafes, classrooms, and food service kitchens of Iowa City's, sometimes to violent and electrifying consequence. Finally, as each prepares for an uncertain future, the group heads to a cabin to bid goodbye to their former lives, a moment of reckoning that leaves each of them irrevocably altered. Not necessarily a description that would have caught my attention without the existence of real life, kind of similar to the Rebecca Mackay book, but I trust Brandon Taylor. I am interested to read more of his work, and uh, hopefully I will be able to get a copy easily when it is released. So the next book comes directly from my love of the Gunkel, which I read recently. It's The Celebrants by Stephen Rowley. It will be published by G.B. Putnam Sons on May 30th. Here is what they say. It's been a minute, or five years, since Jordan Vargas last saw his college friends and 28 years since their graduation when their adult lives officially began. Now, Jordan, Jordy, Naomi, Craig, and Mariel find themselves at the brink of a new decade with all the responsibilities of adulthood, yet no closer to having their lives figured out. That That's not for a lack of trying. Over the years, they've reunited in Big Sur to honor a decades-old pact to throw each other living funerals, celebrations to remind themselves that life is worth living and living well. But this reunion is different. They've not gathered as they were to bolster Marielle as her marriage crumbled, to lift Naomi after her parents died, or to intervene when Craig pleaded guilty to art fraud. This time, Jordan is sitting on a secret that will upend their pact. A deeply honest tribute to the growing pains of selfhood and the people who keep us going, coupled with Stephen Rowley's signature humor and heart, The Celebrants is a moving tale about the false invincibility of youth and the beautiful ways in which friendship helps us celebrate our lives, even amid the deepest challenges of living. I enjoyed the gunkle enough that I'm... Although parts of that, again, sound a little familiar... I'm willing to go along with it and see what kind of a take Stephen Rowley will have on the situation. We're getting there. The next one is Page Boy, a memoir by Elliot Page. I think you can guess why I am interested in reading this book, which is published on June 6th by Flatiron Books. Quote, can I kiss you? It was two months before the world premiere of Juno, and Elliot Page was in his first ever queer bar. The hot summer air hung heavy around him as he looked at her, and then it happened, in front of everyone. A previously unfathomable experience. Here he was, on the precipice of discovering himself as a queer person, as a trans person, getting closer to his desires, his dreams, himself, without the repression he had carried for so long. But for Elliot, two steps forward had always come with one step back. With Juno's massive success, Elliot became one of the world's most beloved actors. His dreams were coming true, but the pressure to perform suffocated him. He was forced to play the part of the glossy young starlet, a role that made his skin crawl on and off set. The career that had been an escape out of his reality and into a world of imagination was suddenly a nightmare. As he navigated criticism and abuse from some of the most powerful people in Hollywood, a past that snapped at his heels, and a society dead set on forcing him into a binary, Elliot often stayed silent, unsure of what to do, until enough was enough. Full of behind-the-scenes details and intimate interrogations on sex, love, trauma, and Hollywood, Page Boy is the story of a life pushed to the brink. But at its core, this beautifully written, winding journey of what it means to untangle ourselves from the expectations of others is an ode to stepping into who we truly are with defiance, strength, and joy. I want it right now. And especially with all of the challenges to transgender transitional care uh to transgender stories this will hopefully be an important book this year i'm really looking forward to it the next book is crook manifesto by colson whitehead i've seen this referred to as a sequel to 
Harlem Shuffle, which was released, again, I don't remember if it was last year or the year before. I feel like it was probably the year before. What is time? I have not managed to read this yet, and I don't know how much of a sequel this is, but it does seem like it follows the same character, since this follows an upstanding furniture salesman named Carney, and Crook Manifesto is described as th in this way. It's 1971. Trash piles up on the streets. Crime is at an all-time high. The city is careening towards bankruptcy, and a shooting war has broken out between the NYPD and the Black Liberation Army. Amidst this collective nervous breakdown, furniture store owner and ex-fence Ray Carney tries to keep his head down and his business thriving. His days moving stolen goods around the city are over. It's strictly the straight and narrow for him until he needs Jackson 5 tickets for his daughter May, and he decides to hit up his old police contact, Munson, fixer extraordinaire. But Munson has his own favors to ask of Carney, and staying out of the game gets a lot more complicated and deadly. So I think I need to read Harlem Shuffle first because I have not gotten around to that one yet. Obviously, I know Colson Whitehead from his two Pulitzer wins. He is one of only four authors who have won two Pulitzer Prizes for fiction for Underground Railroad and the Nickel Boys. I did attempt to read his zombie book before he ever became a Pulitzer winner, and I didn't like it. I didn't finish it. I, I can't remember if it's called Zone 6, something like that. I do really appreciate him as a writer. I didn't like that book, but I have liked the two that I have read, which are the Pulitzer ones. And I really want to get to Harlem Shuffle, and I think that the Crook Manifesto will be an interesting book as well. It will be published on July 18th by Doubleday Books. I do have access to it on NetGalley, but I think I need to read Harlem Shuffle before I get into it. The next one is something that I'm willing to bet wouldn't have jumped out to a lot of people. It's Disruptions, a story collection from Stephen Milhauser. I read one book by Stephen Milhauser. It was a story collection called Dangerous Laughter. And it was weird. It was very weird. But I remember really liking it. And I, honestly, I couldn't really tell you anything that happened in it. It was published in somewhere around the year 2007. I think one of the stories involves like a skyscraper that it goes all the way up to the sky, something like that. But I remember really liking it. Stephen Milhauser is also a Pulitzer Prize winner. He won in 1997 or 98 for Martin Dressler, but I have not read that one yet. Here's what they say about this collection. An exquisite new collection from a Pulitzer Prize winning master of the short story, the culmination of a five decade career, work that takes us beneath the placid surface of suburban life into the elusive strangeness of the everyday. Here are 18 stories of astonishing rage and precision. A housewife drinks alone in her Connecticut living room. A guillotine glimmers above a sleepy town green. A pre-recorded customer service message sends a caller into a reverie of unspeakable yearning. With the deft touch and funhouse mirrors perspectives for which he has won countless admirers, Stephen Milhauser gives us the towns, marriages, and families of a quintessential American lifestyle that is at once instantly recognizable and profoundly unsetting. unsettling. Sorry. This will be published by Knopf on August 1st, and I'm really looking forward to it. I am excited to get around to Martin Dressler. I remember really liking Dangerous Laughter, and I think this will be a very interesting book. The next book does not have a jacket at this point in time. It's The Vaster Wilds by Lauren Groff. I read Matrix at the beginning of last year and loved it. It was one of my favorite reads from last year. Uh, just fantastic. And this sounds like it would be great. It's going to be published by Riverhead on September 12th. I already have a copy pre-ordered at Montana Book Company. I'm just looking forward to it. Here's what they say. A taut and electrifying novel from celebrated best-selling author Lauren Groff about one spirited girl alone in the wilderness trying to survive. A servant girl escapes from a colonial settlement in the wilderness. She carries nothing with her but her wits, a few possessions, and the spark of God that burns hot within her. What she finds in this terra incognita is behind, beyond the limits of her imagination and will bend her belief in everything that her own civilization has taught her. Lauren Groff's new novel is at once a thrilling adventure story and a penetrating fable about trying to find a new way of living in a world succumbing to the churn of colonialism. Sounds fascinating. And kind of in the vein of Matrix... I had been thinking about Fates and Furies, which is next to this blue thing next to Matrix on my shelf, and I hear mixed things about it, so I'm kind of glad that this book is coming in <laughs> to the fray because it sounds like it's sort of similar to what she did with Matrix, uh, and a new book that I can definitely, definitely get behind. I'm really excited for that. And then we have How to Protect Bookstores and Why the Present and Future of Bookselling by Danny Kane. Danny Kane is one of the owners of Raven Bookstore in Kansas. He is famous because he published a book called How to Resist Amazon and Why. This is a new book, and it's kind of like doing a similar thing, but talking about 
the importance of bookstores and what they do. It uses um, actual bookstores as case studies and talks about how they survive, how they thrive, and the things that they manage to do for their community and the threats that they face in the current world of book selling. I'm really looking forward to it. It will be published on September 19th. I already have a copy pre-ordered at Montana Book Company, and I'm really looking forward to it. All right, the final book on my list. You can guess. There's no jacket for it. It's Let Us Descend, a novel by Jessamyn Ward. Jessamyn Ward uh, won a National Book Award for Salvage the Bones, and then her next novel, which was called Sing Unburied Sing, also won the National Book Award for Fiction. In my opinion, Sing Unburied Sing should have won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. It didn't. It's a whole thing. I have a video about the book that did win the Pulitzer Prize that year in a deep dive. I'll link it down below. It's Less by Andrew Sean Greer. Here's what they say about the new book. I think it's only a matter of time before Jessamyn Ward wins a Pulitzer Prize for fiction, so I'm going to be watching this book very closely. It also sounds fantastic. Let Us Descend is a reimagining of American slavery, as beautifully rendered as it is heart-wrenching. Searching, harrowing, replete with transcendent love, the novel is a journey from the rice fields of the Carolinas to the slave markets of New Orleans and into the fearsome heart of a Louisiana sugar plantation. Annis, sold south by the white enslaver who fathered her, is the reader's guide through this hellscape. As she struggles through the miles-long march, Annis turns inward, seeking comfort from memories of her mother and stories of her African warrior grandmother. Throughout, she opens herself to a world beyond this world, one teeming with spirits of earth and water, of myth and history, spirits who nurture and give, and those who manipulate and take. While Ward leads readers through the descent, this, her fourth novel, is ultimately a story of rebirth and reclamation. I can't wait for that book. I really can't. I think it's going to be fantastic, and I'm really just looking forward to it. So those are the books that I've sort of picked out. Obviously, other books will be announced as the year goes along. But I'd love to hear if there's anything I missed that you're interested in that will be coming out and what you think of the books that I have put on this list. Let me know all of that in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.